All right, everyone, welcome back to Calculus 3. Uh, so today we're going to continue on studying multivariable functions and specifically the calculus of multivariable functions. Now, um, one thing that's kind of easy to forget when you're in the, you know, in the trenches actually taking this class is what calculus actually is. And remember, calculus is the mathematical study of change. And in particular, there are two ways that we measure that. We measure instantaneous rates of change through derivatives, and we measure total amounts of change through integrals. So what we're going to do is, since we were able to do that stuff with single variable functions, there's no reason why we can't do it with multivariable functions. Although the specific way in which we're going to do it will be a bit different uh, than before here. Um, so what we're gonna to learn today is the multivariable equivalent of the derivative called the partial derivative. So let's remind ourselves what the single variable derivative is and how, and we're gonna use that as an inspiration to make a definition for the multivariable derivative right here. So remember the, the single variable derivative was actually a limit. And remember everything in calculus can be traced back to a limit in some way. That's kind of the glue that holds everything together. So the single variable derivative was the limit as h goes to zero, although some people write uh, delta x, of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And remember, this represents the instantaneous rate of change. Because the, the normal just rate of change without instantaneous would just be this where h is some non-zero number. But then as we send h to zero, this becomes more and more accurate of the change happening at one point. And then finally in the limit, it becomes the instantaneous rate of change. Now here we only have a single variable. So what happens if F depends on both X and Y? Well, it turns out that if we have two variables, then we have two different ways our function can change. It can change when we move the X variable and we could change when it, we move the Y variable as well. So because that there's more than one way of changing our function, because there's more than one variable, we have more than one derivative for each function. And each one of these derivatives is called a partial derivative because each one only tells part of the story. It only tells what happens when one variable changes. Okay, so let's see what these are. So if we have Z is a function of X and Y, the partial derivatives of F with respect to X and Y are the functions FX and FY defined by F of XY is the limit as H goes to zero of f of x plus h comma y minus f of x y divided by h. And we have a similar definition here. We have the limit as h goes to zero of f of x y plus h minus f of x y divided by h. And notice that we, when we do the x derivative, only the x is changing. Notice that the y is exactly the same in each case. And then, of course, it's the other way around with y. Notice that the y is the only thing that has the h applied to it here. All right, now you might be wondering, okay, well, what happens if you change both of them at once? Uh, we'll eventually get to that in a later lesson where we can change both variables at the same time and see what kind of derivative that is. But for now, we're just going to change these separately. Now, there are a bunch of different ways of expressing the partial derivative. So if we have z as our function, Kind of like how in calc one we had dy dx, df dx, f prime of x. There are a bunch of different ways of expressing the derivative. We have the same situation with partial derivatives. So one way of writing, say, the partial derivative with respect to x would be to kind of write this curly looking d thing. Um, and then you put f and then put that same curly looking d and then put x. And this is called the partial derivative symbol or partial. Um, I think some people also call it del as well. Um, the way you read this is partial f, partial x. That's the usual way that this is said verbally. All right. Kind of like how this is said dy dx, not usually dy over dx. The word over is usually omitted. So in the same way we could write this as partial f, partial x, what's another way you think we could write it here? That's right, yeah. So kind of like how we could write it as dy or df back here, we're gonna write it as partial z, partial x as well. Is it a lowercase delta? Actually, a lowercase delta looks like this. So lowercase delta is this, which is a little bit different 
um, from this guy. Actually, if you take advanced mathematics, there's actually a derivative where you look at something um, like this maybe, but we're not gonna talk about that. All right, and then, so then the same thing happens for y as well. We would have partial f, partial y, and partial z, partial y. So the nice thing about having a different symbol rather than just d right here is that if you see a partial derivative appear for a function, that immediately implies that this function is a multivariable function. If it were only a single variable function, we would just see it written one of these ways. But if we see a partial derivative, even if I don't put f of x, y, or z of x, y, we automatically know there's more than one derivative because otherwise we wouldn't be using partial derivatives. All right. Let's see here. And then if we want to express a partial derivative at a particular value, like maybe we want to do the partial derivative of x uh, with respect to x at the point a, b, then we simply substitute in a, b here. Or if we're using the partial notation with the, the curly d's here, we would put a line and then whatever point you're at. And of course, the same thing works for y as well. All right, so that's all of the notation and stuff. And I, th I don't think it'll take too long to... Uh, get used to that. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to what this actually means. What does this signify here? So let's take a look at the geometric interpretation. So I want to go back to calc one for a moment. Remember the geometric interpretation of the derivative, like let's say we have the derivative right here. What, what is, actually let me ask you guys about this. What is the, um, the geometric interpretation of the derivative? The derivative is the what? It's the slope of the tangent line. That's right. So if we have a tangent line to our function right here, then the slope of this is going to be our derivative. So this is how it worked back in Calc 1 with a single variable. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to cheat and we're going to copy this Calc 1 definition, only we're going to use it in a particular place um, with our surface here. So let's say we want to take the partial derivative, partial z, partial x right here. What we do is we freeze a particular y value, say b, and we look at the plane y equals b, which is this. So this is the space where all of our y values are gonna be b. Now this plane will intersect with our surface and it'll actually make a curve based on that. So that we're almost kind of taking a cross section out of our surface right here. So kind of taking this cross section where all of our y coordinates would be. Now, what does the partial derivative represent? Well, we have a curve right here, right? And it's actually a 1D curve. So that means that we can use the traditional definition of the derivative here. So it's gonna be the slope of the tangent line of this curve right here. And how will it work with the other derivative? Well, it works exactly the same way. Rather than freezing a Y value, we're going to freeze an X value right here. So we're going to freeze our x value. Every point in this plane has the same x value. It cuts through whatever our surface is, and then it gives us a 1D curve. You can almost imagine this is like the trace. Actually, this literally is the trace of this surface right here. We're figuring out the slope of the tangent line to the trace. That's what we're doing here. So we're kind of doing calc 1, but we're doing it in these special planes right here. All right, and that's essentially what they're saying down here. So it's the slope of the tangent line to the curve C1, where C1 is the curve that we make by taking a cross section or a slice out of the surface right here. Now, what this is saying is that we freeze Y and we see what happens as we change the X variable. So this is kind of like a scientific way of doing things. When, usually when you wanna test for something in science, you try to freeze as many other variables as you can and it only change one thing. That's exactly what's happening with the partial derivative. We freeze the other variables and we just focus on whatever this one is right here. All right. So with that in mind, let's see how we would actually compute partial derivatives. Now you may have flashbacks to Calc 1 where the first few lessons we had to use the limit definition of the derivative uh, to do derivatives. Don't worry, we won't have to do that here. We know you guys know that the derivative is, is a limit. We don't need to emphasize that anymore. So we're just gonna go, jump go like straight ahead to just doing it uh, normally without using limits directly here. 
All right. Um, let's see here. It seems like there's some unrelated uh, stuff going on in the chat here. Why don't we try to focus on partial derivatives here? All right. So let's see here. So let's actually try computing one of these partial derivatives. And remember, the key idea for a partial derivative is that the other variables are constant. When we're doing a partial derivative, we're only changing the, the, um, the variable that we are doing the derivative with respect to. So for example, with partial f, partial x, we're only changing x. And then of course, partial f, partial y, only changing y. All right, so let's apply this philosophy and see if we can do some partial derivatives here. So it says, find the partial derivatives of our function here. So our function is y sine of x squared plus xy plus y squared. All right, why don't we start by doing partial f, partial x right here. Okay, I, I, I usually try to do this with a multicolored pen, but unfortunately I forgot it today. I like to draw one variable in one color, one in the other. But, so in this case, I guess we're gonna have to use our imagination. Anytime we see a y, right here, uh, we're gonna pretend it's like a number. So for example, you can imagine every y, we're gonna, it's gonna treat it like it's a constant, say like two or something. And we're gonna do the calc one derivative if we imagine that all of these are constants. All right, so let's see here, only x is the variable. So it looks like we have the derivative of a constant times sine of something. So the derivative of a constant times sine of something will be that constant times cosine of the same thing. And then what do we need to do afterwards? What, what rule are we gonna invoke now? The chain rule, that's right. Cause we did the derivative of something with something non-trivial plugged inside. So we need to do the derivative of that. We're gonna use the chain rule here. So now we're gonna do the derivative with respect to X of all of this stuff. Well, let's see, the derivative with respect to x of x squared is, well, 2x. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The derivative of xy with respect to x, well, imagine it as a constant times x. What's the derivative of a constant times x? It's whatever the constant is. So the derivative of xy will be y. And then can anyone tell me what the derivative of y squared is gonna be here? It's gonna be zero, that's right. Remember, y squared is just some weird constant. Anything involving only y's is gonna be constant. So we're gonna get a zero out of that. So there we go. There is our, our partial derivative with respect to x. All right, let's see what the derivative with respect to y is. Um, let's see here. So now we have a variable times sine of something. Uh, so what rule do we need to use in that case? The product rule, that's right. So I'm gonna do the derivative with respect to y of y, which is one, and then leave all of this alone. X squared, x, y, y squared. All right, then I'm going to leave the y alone and do the derivative of this with respect to y. So again, we're gonna invoke the chain rule. So we have the derivative of sine is cosine, our same inside. And now we're gonna do the y derivative of this, which is different than the x derivative. So if I do the y derivative of x squared, I'm gonna end up with zero because now this time x is a constant. So we have zero. The y derivative of x times y, well, y is the variable, x is a constant. So we're gonna end up with x. And then the y derivative of y squared will be two y. This kind of uses the same mathematical muscles as implicit differentiation, where we have to always keep in mind which variable we're differentiating with respect to. So it kind of has the same feeling that that does right here. All right, so there we go. And notice, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, th I thought this was pretty obvious, I guess, but the, the y derivative does not necessarily need to be the same as the x derivative. These are pretty clearly different functions. So we can have a different rates of change in y as we do with respect to x. Okay, now let's move on to this next example right here. All right, so now we have a function of three variables. We have f of x, y, and z. Now, partial derivatives work the same way, whether you have two variables, three variables, four variables, a million variables, you could simply do the derivative with respect to each one of them. But every time you do that, 
all of the other variables, all of them are going to be treated as constants. All right, so let's do the three different partial derivatives here. Partial f, partial x, let's see. Um, so I have e to the 2x times cosine of z squared. Now this has no x's in it, so it's a constant. So I guess I'll just have that. And then the derivative of e to the 2x will be 2e to the 2x. And then what's the derivative of this part going to be? Not too difficult. What, what, what is this going to be? Zero. That's right. Yeah, because there's no x's in here whatsoever. So everything in here is some bizarre constant. But no matter how bizarre it is, the derivative of a constant is zero. We just get cosine of z squared 2e to the 2x. All right, let's do y now. Let's see here. Uh, the derivative of this will likewise be zero because there are no y's in here at all. So this is just a big old constant. Then I do the derivative of this over here. This has no y's in it, so it's a constant times the function. And then the derivative of this will be 3e e to the 3y right here. What happened to the cosine of z squared? You mean this right here? Well, there aren't any y's in this, so the derivative of all this stuff will be zero. All right, and then let's move on to the final derivative here, partial f partial z. Let's see what this is gonna give us. Now there are z's in both of these terms, so we won't be losing a term this time. All right, e to the two x is a constant. Uh, the derivative of cosine of z squared, well, let's see, we're gonna get a negative sine of z squared, and then we multiply by the derivative of z squared, which is 2z. Now it's getting especially important to put lines through your z's because the this symbol, the two and the z all look relatively the same. So make sure you put a line through your z's if you can. All right, next up over here, um, either the three y is a constant, and then we have the derivative of sine of 2z, which will be 2 cosine of 2z. There we go. So we have all of our partial derivatives right here. All right. Oops, there we go. Okay, so effectively, if you, if you remember your, your um, derivative rules back from Calc 1, especially the chain rule, the chain rule is gonna be even more common than it used to be. Uh, but if you remember all of those um, derivative rules, then you'll be absolutely fine doing partial derivatives. All right, let's let's tackle something a little bit more, a um, little bit less direct here. What we're going to do is we're going to find the slope of the tangent line to the curve of intersection of the surface z equals this and the plane x equals one at this point. Well, let's see. We were actually already thinking about that. Um, earlier in the class, right? Like we even have a picture of something that kind of looks like that. So let's take a look at this picture. Here we have a plane, and then here we have a surface, right? And here is the curve of intersection. So we want to find the slope of the tangent line to that curve of intersection, meaning we're going to use a partial derivative. And since x is the number that's being fixed, the, the number that, or the variable that has a plane, we're going to use the y derivative right here. So effectively what they want us to do is they want us to figure out what partial z partial y is going to be right here. All right, well, first let's figure out, yeah, let's figure out what that derivative is. So let's see, so we have the derivative of square root of something. Um, so the derivative of square root of something is one over two times the square root of that same something. All right, and then now we multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now remember, we're doing the y derivative of the inside. So the derivative of 36 is zero. The derivative of negative nine x squared, which is a constant now, is zero. And then the derivative of negative four y squared is gonna be negative eight y. So if we simplify, we have negative four y over the square root of 36 minus nine x squared minus four y squared. All right, so this is the partial derivative for any x and y value, but we want specific x and y values, right? We wanna know what the rate of change of this um, curve is at x is one and then y is negative two. 
So why don't we figure out what that is? We're gonna plug in one negative two. All right, let's see. So we have negative four times negative two divided by the square root of 36 minus, uh, let's see, nine times one squared minus four times negative two squared. All right, up top we have an eight. Let's see what we get down here. Uh, 36 minus nine is 27. And then minus 16 gives us 11. So there we go. We have eight over the square root of 11. So this is going to be the slope of the tangent line to the curve of intersection, meaning the slope of this line right here will be eight over root 11. That's effectively what we just figured out here. All right, so I said that partial derivatives were a lot like, um, is it just, oh yeah, I, I, that's a good question. Is it just coincidence that the root 11 matches the Z value? Actually, it's not a coincidence because look at what this is. We have root 36 over negative nine, or root 36 minus nine X squared minus four Y squared. What's a shorter name for that? Z, right. So a weird way of writing this would be negative four Y over Z. So we could have actually avoided doing all that stuff. We could have just plugged in root 11 there. So actually, no, in this case, that was not a coincidence. Uh, you won't always be so lucky though. You won't always be able to put the original function back into the derivative. All right, uh, speaking of something like this, actually, it's good, this is a nice transition here. Um, I mentioned earlier, or we, we discovered earlier that partial derivatives seem to have a lot in common with implicit differentiation. But it turns out that you can do implicit differentiation with partial derivatives. So notice how we have, in this problem, we have z is a function of x and y. But the thing is, is that z is kind of mixed in to the formula for x and y. It's not like it was up here where we have z is um, stuff with x and y. Um, it's just kind of mixed in there. So we're going to need to do implicit differentiation in order to figure out this partial derivative. All right, so let's write this out. So we have yz minus log of z, x squared plus y squared. And we need to remember that z can have it, z depends on x and y, but x and y are independent from one another. All right, now let's do the partial derivative with respect to x. And by the way, just like uh, single variable derivatives, if you write this without like a function, that, that's like an operation. You're doing this operation on this stuff right here. You can use the same kind of notation. All right, let's see here. So we're doing a derivative with respect to x. So y is a constant times something. We're gonna leave the y. And then z depends on x and y. So we're gonna write its partial derivative like this. So since z is the dependent variable here, we need to write it as partial z, partial x right here. All right, next we have a log of z. So the derivative of natural log of something is one over whatever that something is. And then we multiply by the derivative of z, which again is partial z, partial x. Um, I don't think anyone in here had me for calc one, maybe someone did, but I'm not sure. But the way to imagine, um, the way I like to explain this in calc one with implicit differentiation, whenever you do a derivative involving z, just tack on a partial z, partial x to the end of whatever you're doing. So we did a derivative involving z here, one over z, and then we just stick a partial z, uh, partial x right here. All right. Why'd you write with respect to x? Because we're trying to figure out what this is. So we need to do the derivative with respect to x. All right, now we're gonna do the derivative with respect to x of this side. Uh, the derivative of this will be two x. And then the derivative of this with respect to x will be zero. So we're just gonna have two x. Now remember, the goal is to figure out what partial z partial x is. So we're gonna solve for that. So notice that I have it in both of these equations right here. So now I have y minus one over z, partial z partial x, because I could factor that out of everything. All right. And then we have two x over here. And now I'm going to divide by this right here. A well, y is y squared zero. We're doing the derivative with respect to x. And the derivative with respect to x of y squared is going to be zero right here. 
All right. So then now we have partial z partial x, and we could divide this over. And then if you want, you could leave your answer like this. Uh, although we could also simplify it, have not avoid a compound fraction by multiplying the top and bottom by z. Um, so you could write like this as well. That's I, either way is totally fine. All right. Let's see here. There we go. So we managed to figure this one out. And notice that like kind of like how we had implicit derivatives in calc one that had y in our answer, we have implicit derivatives here. We're going to have z in our answer. All righty. All right, so that so we've done a lot of examples of first derivatives, and then you might guess, well, hey, wait a minute. In Calc 1, we took more than one derivative of the same function. Can we do that here? And the answer is yes, we are able to do that um, in Calc 3. All right, so let's take a look at um, what's going on here. Now, since we have multiple ways of doing the first derivative, it stands to reason that we're going to have multiple or maybe even more ways of doing the second derivative. And that does end up panning out. So the first way we could do a second derivative here um, is we just take the derivative with respect to x twice in a row. And the way that works is we figure out what the partial derivative of the function with respect to x is, and then we just do it again. So I don't think that one's a, a big surprise here. Now there's another way of writing this right here. Um, another way of writing partial derivatives is by putting a little subscript here. So for example, this is the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and then we take the derivative of that with respect to x. But a more common way of seeing this would just be fxx, meaning we do two x derivatives right here. So this is, this is probably the more common notation than that. All right, and then I think it's pretty clear in the same way we could do the, um, the derivative twice with respect to y. So this is going to be f y, and then we apply another y to it. So then this will be f y y. All right. Now where things get interesting is the where we take the derivative first with respect to one thing, and then with respect to another. So what this one is doing is we take our x derivative first, whatever is the rightmost thing here is happened first, and then we do the derivative with respect to y, right here. All right, so how would we write that? Well, let's see, so we have fx, and then we're gonna do a y derivative of that. So it stands to reason that this is gonna be called f of x, y right here. All right, and then we could also do it the other way around. Uh, this way, we do the y derivative first, and then we apply an x derivative to that. We have f of y, and then we do an x derivative, this one will be f y x. So when we're in this notation right here, we, we read left to right, whichever derivative, whichever variable is here first is the first one we do, and then we do this one. And then maybe if we were crazy enough to do a third derivative with respect to x, we would put an x at the end there. And then this one's doing y first and then x. Um, now these last two cases right here, these are called mixed partial derivatives for I think pretty clear reasons we're just having multiple uh, variables that we're doing the derivative with respect to. All right, so let's practice doing some of this stuff. And doing this is about as hard as doing higher derivatives in Calc 1. You simply just do two derivatives. That, that's all we're gonna do here. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the mixed partials for this function, sine of xy squared. So we're gonna find fxy, and then we're gonna find fyx fxy, so remember which one this was, this is where we do the x derivative first, and then we do a y derivative after that. Uh, can we do a partial with respect to x, y, and z? So if your function depends on three variables, then yeah, you could have f of x, y, z, and then have three variables right there. Absolutely. Yeah, the partial derivatives work the same way for any number of variables, two or, or higher. And technically, a partial derivative with one variable is just the derivative. So it also works with one variable too. All right. So anyways, let's go ahead and do this right here. So let's do the x derivative of this. So remember, x is my variable now, meaning that this y squared is a constant. 
So the derivative of sine of x times a constant would be where we just move that constant out to the front and then have cosine. Okay, so there's our x derivative, but remember, we're gonna have to do a y derivative after this right here. All right, so now with y's, we have a function of y times another function of y. So I'm gonna do the derivative of this and get two y and then leave the cosine alone. Then I'm going to leave the y squared alone and do the derivative of cosine. Now this is cosine of y squared times a constant. So the derivative of cosine will be negative sine. And we have the same inside. And then we multiply by the y derivative of this, a constant times y squared. So we bring the square down and lower the power by one keep x as a constant, and then we get this right here. So this is going to be, um, like I said, there's gonna be a lot of chain rule going on here and we need to pick, um, uh, we need to be very careful about which one's the variable, which one's not the variable. Oh, did you guys copy, copy del or partial from somewhere? Yeah, if you, if you wanna answer something in the chat though, just feel free to use D, that's, that's also okay, that's, that's typing version, unless you wanna go into full LaTeX, which I think it's, that's terrible to type with for uh, chat boxes. All right, and if we simplify this, oops, we're gonna have a minus two x y cubed sine of x y squared. All right, so this is our mixed partial. We do an x derivative and a y derivative. All right, now let's do it the other way around. So this is where we're gonna have a y derivative and then we're going to have an x derivative there afterwards. All right, so what's the y derivative of this? Well, let's see, we have sine of a constant times y squared. So I'm gonna have cosine of all of that. And then the derivative of this, kind of like we saw back here is two xy. And then all of this stuff is gonna have its x derivative taken. All right, let's do the x derivative right here. So let's see, the derivative of cosine of xy squared will be negative sine of xy squared. And then we multiply by the x derivative of this, which is y squared. And then we have the 2xy, which we left alone right here. All right, and then um, let's see, so we did the derivative of this, left that alone. Now we'll just leave this alone. And then do the X derivative of this, which will just be two Y. So if we clean this up a little bit, we have two Y cosine of X, Y squared uh, minus two X, Y cubed sine of X, Y squared. All right, so there was our first mixed partial. And then there was our second mixed partial right here. Okay, so there's something interesting going on here, which I'm sure a lot of you guys can see. What, what, what interesting thing is happening here? They're the same thing, right? So I did the X derivative then the Y derivative, and I did the Y derivative and the X derivative, and I ended up getting exactly the same thing. Now, first, if you're being careful, you might think, oh, well, maybe you just happen to be like, pick a special function that that ended up being the case with. Like kind of like how E is the derivative of itself. Maybe there's something kind of similar to that for Calc 3. But it turns out that this is not just a coincidence for this function. This actually works for many different functions. It doesn't matter which order you do the mixed partials. It only matters the number of X derivatives you do and the number of Y derivatives you do, not the order in which you do them. Does it work for all? The answer is no. Um, so specifically, how does this work? Uh, this is uh, something called Clairaut's theorem. I think I might be saying that right. Maybe some French person can um, correct me. Uh, but assume that F is defined on some open set D, and this is D for domain with X and Y values. If the mixed partials are continuous on D, then they are equal on the domain. So if we go back here and we look at these functions, well, this is a continuous function, right? And this is continuous. So if these end up being both continuous, then they end up going to be uh, the same right here. So that's pretty nice. And honestly, we don't run into discontinuous derivatives that often. 
Uh, it has to be kind of contrived for that to happen. So most of the time, most of the time that we're going to be dealing with, you could do the mixed partials in any order that you want. Okay, but just to be safe, let's, let's take a look at an example where that doesn't work out. So just to see that it doesn't always work that way. So we can kind of keep that in the back of our minds, uh, just in case we see a weird example in the future. All right, so let's suppose that f of xy is this piecewise function where we have x cubed y minus xy cubed over x squared plus y squared. And this is gonna be where x and y are not zero. But in the case where both of them are zero, we're just gonna say that this function is zero. You might notice that if I plug zero in for both of these, I'm gonna be dividing by zero. So what we're kinda do is we're almost like patching the hole for this function by sticking in a zero right there. Okay. So we can use the limit definition of the partial derivative, or honestly, we can just use um, our normal quotient rule of doing this, although this would be kind of hideous. Um, we can do that, and we'll see that if we have the partial der derivative with respect to y, and y is zero, then we're gonna end up with x right here. That's gonna be our function when we take the partial derivative and then plug in y equals zero. Now, if we do it the other way around, we do the x derivative and then plug in x is zero, we end up getting negative y if we do that. I'm not gonna show all the work for that. That's gonna take a little bit too long. And uh, yeah, I don't think we, yeah, we don't have time for that. Okay, now what happens when we do the mixed partial? So I did the y. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do partial partial x of partial f partial y. Okay, well, we just saw that this was x or I just claimed it was x. So this is gonna end up giving us one right here. So partial x or partial squared f, oops, my mistake, of partial x partial y is going to be one. Now on the other hand, let's do it in the other order. So let's say we do the y derivative of the x partial. So this means we're doing the y derivative of negative, or sorry, well, I spoiled it, of y, negative y, which will be negative one. So in this case, if we do the partials in the other order, we end up getting negative one instead right here. So this does show you that there are limits to this. There's going to be situations where you can't just flip the order of it. But like I said, you have to have some kind of a contrived looking function like this in order for that to actually occur. Okay, so we saw that the mixed partials uh, didn't work out, they weren't the same. That means that our uh, mixed partials were not continuous at zero. So let's see why they weren't continuous at zero. So here's, here's the insane stuff we would get if we did the quotient rule on that formula up there. So if we did the quotient rule once with respect to X and then another time with respect to Y, we would end up getting this. And these guys are going to agree as long as we're not at the origin right here. All right, so then now what happens if we approach zero, zero in two different ways? So let's say we approach it along the x-axis. Now another way of saying the x-axis is y equals zero, right? So what we're doing is we're taking the limit as x goes to zero, and then we plug in y equals zero for all of this stuff right here. So there's an x to the sixth, that's not gonna be affected. But then we have y equals zero here, that's zero. We have y equals zero here, this is zero. We have y equals zero here, that's zero. Then we have y equals zero down here and we have x squared cubed, meaning we have x to the sixth. So what's the limit as x goes to zero of this? It's gonna be one. Now, if we take the same formula and we approach it along the y-axis instead, and this is where x is zero, now we're doing the limit as y goes to zero, um, let's see, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, um, but this is, this is not zero, this is negative y of six, because it has no x's there. And then we plug in zero for the x down here, and we have y squared cubed. So this limit is gonna give us negative one right here. And since these do not agree, remember the limits, no matter which way you approach for a continuous function have to agree. But since these two limits do not agree, that means our function is not continuous at that point. A way of imagining this, um, let's see if I can do a little craft right here on the spot. Probably not, but we'll try it. Let's 
see here. Um, this function looks kind of like this, where if you go one way, you're going to head towards negative one. And then if you go a different way, you're going to head towards a different value. So in, in 3D world, that's kind of what this derivative is, is doing right here. I'm not exactly sure what way it looks specifically, but it's something kind of like this. Hopefully you guys at home can see that this is lower and this is higher right here. All right. So the moral of the story is that except for a few weird functions like this, you could take your derivatives in any order. So let's go on to the next problem and see that. Let's see here. If the partial derivatives agree, does that mean the graph is not continuous itself? Um, the graph of the partial derivatives is not continuous. The original graph needs to be continuous in any case because you can't do a derivative unless you're continuous. So no matter what, the original graph is going to be continuous. This is the graph of f of x, y, or f of y, x. That's this graph right here. The original graph needs to be continuous or else you can't do um, a derivative at all. All right. So let's see here. Let's, let's take a look at this derivative. So let's say for some reason we wanted to do the third derivative of a function. Now, to be honest, most applications actually stop at the second derivative or something, usually because Newton's second law only has two derivatives and a lot of things come from that. But say we were doing a third derivative for some reason, there are things like that out there. Um, how will we do that? Well, let's see here. So we have f of x is e to the x, y. So I need to do one y derivative and then two x derivatives of this. Okay, so let's see here. So this is going to start with me doing a y derivative followed by two x derivatives right here. All right, let's see. So what's the y derivative of this? Well, this is e to a constant times y. So that constant's just going to pop out. And then I'm going to have e to the x, y here. All right, now I need to do two x derivatives with this. And so this time is y is the constant right here. All right, how do we know to do the y first? Um, well, remember now that unless we're dealing with a really weird function, we didn't need to do y first. And this is actually something I'm going to illustrate in a moment here. I'm going to do the derivative in this order, and then I'm going to do it in a different order, and we should end up with the same thing. So I'm going to do the x derivative here, and then we have the product rule. So we have 1 times e to the xy plus x, and then the derivative of this with respect to x will be y e to the xy. All right. So let's see right here. Let's do our x derivative. So the x derivative of this will be y e to the xy, because remember y is our constant. Here we need to do a product rule. So I'm going to do the derivative of xy and just end up with y. And now I'll leave the xy alone and do the x derivative of this, which will multiply by another y. All right, so if I clean all this up, I have 2y e to the xy plus xy squared e to the xy. So that's going to be our third derivative right here. All right. So now let's say I did this in a different order. Let's say I did an x derivative first and then a y, and then I do an x. Let's see if that makes any difference here. And spoiler alert, it's not gonna make any difference. So let's do our x derivative. So we're gonna have y e to the x, y, if we do an x derivative. Okay, now we need to do a y derivative right here. So let's see, that's gonna require the product rule. So I have one times e to the x, y, and then I leave the y alone and I do a y derivative here, which will spit out an x. And this should look a little bit familiar. This is literally what we took the x derivative of earlier back here. We effectively just flipped the order of the first two derivatives right here. 
So we actually already saw what happened with this X derivative since it's literally the same function. We end up with two Y e to the X Y. All right, so you could do any order you want. That's right. So the moral of the story is that this one is just gonna be two X derivatives, one Y derivative. And unless you get something that looks like this, if you get some kind of weird rational function that's piecewise, then I would be a little bit more careful about what order you did it. But if you get something that's kind of nice looking like this, like this or a polynomial or a sine or cosine, something that's, not, that's normally continuous and not piecewise, then you could just go ahead and do it in any order right here. Can you swap the order of the x's? Well, it doesn't really matter which way you do the x's because you do an x derivative, then you do an x derivative. So it doesn't, which way the x's uh, are done doesn't matter. It's really where you do the y derivative for this one. But overall, most of the time, this will just tell you how many x derivatives to do and then how many y derivatives to do right here. If order mattered for this one, let's say order mattered for this one and they wanted the y one done in the middle then this would be written partial X, partial Y, partial X. If order matters, then we would write it like this in order to do it like that. But if order doesn't matter, then they're just gonna write it like this, or they may even write it the other way. They might write DX squared over here and then DY. So what I'm trying to say is overall, most of the time order won't matter. Sometimes if it looks like this, order might matter. So I would be a little bit careful of that. All right, let's see here. So that's actually it. We actually got it done a little bit early today. That's, that's a first, I think. All right, so overall, I guess I'll just summarize this in saying that partial derivatives just take one derivative at a time. You only change the X or we change the Y. Now in the future, we're gonna see what happens. Well, what if I wanna go say diagonally? I wanna move a little bit in the X direction and a little bit of the Y direction and we'll end up coming up with a way of doing that too. So for now we're sticking to just X and Y, but we'll see them combined in the future. All right, guys, let me stop recording here and...